can start. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Wojtek Deneika. In this talk I will be presenting you how to get started with machine learning in a functional way. But uh, before do we do dig into code, I will need to um, introduce you to some theory about machine learning in general, basic concepts, why it's so different from, from procedural programming and uh, after that we will dig in to three classifiers which I have, which I have chosen for this presentation. Uh, about me, uh, currently I am migrating to, to code graphics company in Gdańsk uh, as a .NET developer and previously I was working for various other outsourcing companies in Gdańsk SII, Solvit, uh, GIT Solutions. And uh, besides that, I am a freelancer uh, working basically for one client, which is uh, Voice Lab in Gdańsk. And I am still learning basic concepts about functional programming and, and machine learning in general. Um, so, why this topic? This is something which has been related to my field of work for about a year, I think. Basically, I have graduated college two months ago. My master's diploma was about optical character recognitions in uh, F-sharp and Python. And basically, I have chosen this topic because I wanted to present you my results and my, I'd say, feedback about how easy it is to start machine learning even without any knowledge in field of statistics, mathematics, and etc. So, what will be covered in this in this presentation? Uh, general introduction to machine learning, as, as I said, uh, some theory. I will present three classifiers, but I will not dig in into math. Uh, instead, I decided to go with a broad view of the classifiers, what they do basically, and, and uh, show this to you by the code examples in F-Shop. So let's get started. Mm, currently we have a number of machine learning frameworks available in the market. Uh, many of them are on different platforms. For example, machine learning uh, core is uh, ML core is available on iOS and Swift, and basically this is the newest one I think in the family of those those ones. Uh, but they are very different. For example, uh, the Ama Amazon one and the Microsoft Cognitive Services are offering out of the box complete classifiers, complete models, which we just implement into our applications using the API, call, uh, API key and that's basically it. We don't have a view on what's going on like from the backend and we can't change like the model for ourselves, for our needs. Uh, we then have uh, classic uh, frameworks like Scikit-Learn, TensorFlow, MLLib for Spark, uh, Cafe of, of course, which are Essentially, things we need. We don't need as a program, of course, <coughs> when we are writing our own framework, we need to get into the math behind the logic and etc. We have the classifiers working and basically, basically we, know, we need to know all the algorithms. But for a normal uh, developer as myself or uh, as many of you, uh, those will be, would be sufficient. Uh, by sufficient, I mean they offer out-of-the-box classifiers which we need only data to, to like for example we need data to, uh, to play around with those classifiers and basically create models and at the end we have Accord for .NET which is in my opinion very underrated of, uh, framework and it offers vari variety of classifiers algorithms and it's essentially Think which I was looking for while uh, writing my mobile applications uh, for for my master's diploma. Mm. But the question is, how many of you have ever used one of these frameworks? Maybe someone. Which one? That's good. Perfect. Uh, okay. But doing this, we 
have as a developers opportunity to use machine learning everywhere. But the thing is that not everyone wants to use it. It's getting very much and much popular nowadays, and uh, it's not uh, essentially promoted in any way, I, I would say. But everyone gets a machine learning framework for its own platform. Um, so, moving on, why is it so popular? Basically, uh, because we have access from the high level to all the algorithms offered by, the, by, the, by those frameworks, we can challenge high dimensional um, problems. By high, made, high dimensional, I mean problems with, which are not easily solved by humans. For example, uh, um, for example, playing around with medical data in big data environment or making uh, self-driving cars, etc. And due to the fact that internet is growing up every year, every month. We have rich data sources which are available for free, I'd say, and we only need to look in right places. For example, I was making a neural network which um, was capable of recognizing low low, lowercase, uppercase and digits. Uh, lowercase, uppercase uh, letters and digits. And the data I found basically on one of many universities' websites. So it was, it was ready and only I needed to extract the features I needed. And the next thing is, it is it's very low curve for, for the beginners. A uh, few years back, this was a problem because machine learning in general was designed for statisticians and mathematics, mathematicians. But nowadays, as I said, there are frameworks like TensorFlow, Scikit-Learn, which have documentation, and this documentation is well written, and basically we can start without any knowledge. Uh, available computing power is also an essential thing. Each and every year, Intel and other, many other companies are coming up with uh, solutions which are essentially giving us more power, more, f more free will in, in terms of um, mm, accessing the data, playing around with this data. And basically it, it has great community. Uh, and I don't mean Stack Overflow or something like this. Um, but we need to start from scratch. We don't know what machine learning is in a in, in nutshell. So I will use one of the sentences from Matthias van der Wieler, uh, book, which is called Machine Learning for .NET Developers. And he wrote this one. Machine learning is writing programs for that learn how to perform a task from experience without being explicitly programmed to do so. Well, what does it mean? We can ask ourselves question why, uh, when is the program learning? Well, the program is learning um, when we are giving it to the program much and more, more and more data points and it becomes better at given task um, automatically without code. But we can switch the sentence around and uh, ask ourselves uh, how is this performed? Because when we are doing the same task over and over again, we are basically not learning because we are not getting improved. Uh, so if we give a program more data and becomes um, more productive, more, more accurate, even the fact that we are using classifiers and other um, helpers like activation functions and so on. But how is this different? How is this different from, from the normal procedural programming? Uh, in a traditional programming, we have a data, we write a program, then we are performing a computation and in we have a result. In machine learning approach, we have a data, we know what this data mean. So we have, for example, a CSV file containing uh, in first, so labels and what this label mean. And we basically, we need to make a computation which will result in a program, which will combine those two things together. Uh, and lastly, why f -sharp? Why not Scala or any other object-oriented language? As I said, I needed to have a um, model of 
of classifier on my mobile phone instead of somewhere in the cloud. So I first decided to go on with the C-sharp because I was coding in, in, in Xamarin, but uh, at the end I decided to move on to the functional programming with, uh, with because of obvi obvious reasons. Um, okay, so digging on. This is one of the easiest problems in machine learning in general, uh, and most, most common one. We basically go to this website, kaggle.com, and Google.com, by the way, is um, very good resource to um, get get to the challenges which machine learning offers. So there are a number of challenges in, in, in this website. Most of them are paid. So if you have a team which want to start machine learning and want to earn some money, uh, you can start by doing this. Uh, the community around this, this website is very, I'd say, active. And um, even we, and if, if we don't know anything about machine learning, we can go there, check other person's uh, research, and basically one of the root uh, goals and basically, I'd say, rules about machine learning is if my model is getting th those results on my computer, I, will, I need to be 100% sure that it will give the same result on the other person's computer. But in this case, we will be talking about classifying images, in this case, digits. So, about the data. The data is present in this uh, URL. You, need to, you, you can go there and download, download it by yourself. Uh, the data is split between two files, train CSV and test CSV. Train CSV contains hand-drawn grayscale digits, and each image is this resolution. And each on every pixel is so is a value somewhere between zero and two hundred and fifty-five. Uh, the test set data contains only two columns. First column is the label, and the second uh, second one is basically what do we what, what's the result of this recognition. Um, for the presentation case, I will use only like small portion of this data. The whole whole set contains around 50,000 images. In this case, I will use only 5,000. So, more about the data. Uh, so how can we approach this problem? Let's start with a different question, I think. Uh, imagine we have only four of these numbers. Five, I said, zero, four, and one. And I suppose I would show you these images and basically I ask you how those images are different, how would you classify them? And after that, I will give you another one and ask you how those, 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 different, uh, those images are differ. So what's the, what's, the, what's the common thing and where's some, some difference? Mm, you will probably look at those images and look for a key differences and try to come up with a, with a distance between those two images and where are they different. Basically, distance is the most important thing in terms of classification in machine learning. And by this, I think we will start. We have uh, talked about the distance. And now, let's come up with the solution. What's, what's the most simple way to compare images? I'd say it's, uh, it's a comparison between pixel by pixel, basically. So we can search for a classifier which for or, or the algorithm which would help us do this task. And by this I mean uh, there are things like this. So in let's move on, <laughs> let's say. Uh, the first classifier, which I would, will talk about, is called Manhattan Distance. In Polish it's called Przestrzeń metryczna. Metryka miejska. Metryka miejska też. Uh, also. And this is the easiest way to classify two images, basically. Um, we do the pixel by pixel comparison, and uh, identical images will have the distance of zero. The further the two images are apart, the further the distance is. So it becomes less and less similar. But this classifier has one very uh, I'd say weak side. If we take 
uh, an image which is outside of our training set, so it's not present anywhere, probably our algorithm will fail to recognize this image because it's not, it doesn't have data to, to play with. And the second thing is that if we take a pix uh, uh, an image and try to ship it, shift it to the left side for a one, one pixel basically, it also will have trouble to recognize it. Um, so by saying so, I will move to the code and show you guys how is it code in, in F sharp and without using any, any framework, so without using Accord.net framework. So. Uh, distance. Let me just. Uh, okay. So we have a record uh, of which contains two labels, two, two properties. One is labeled, the other one is pixels. The pixels in uh, the integer of uh, the, the array of integers, and. Uh, after that, we are creating a full function. The function is uh, basically taking the whole uh, row of data from, from the file which we are importing and trying to, it is trying to split it in tuples so we can, in first element, we can have a label and the second one, we, have, we can have the array of integers, so our pixels. Uh, after that, we are implementing the other uh, function, which is uh, reading the whole file, and then we are going to write our classifier. Um, so, uh, so the classifier is, as I wrote in this comment, is creating tuples, and for each pair, it, sh it takes the absolute value of their differences and sum them up, basically. Uh, so we have something like this. And after that, we begin to train our model um, by finding the images which are, which has, which are the, the closest ones. And by doing so, we are returning a function, this function. <laughs> but we need to perform some kind of validation to know how is this model performing. We are doing something called cross-validation. We basically take our um, validation sample, which cons uh, contains 500 of test data provided by, by the URL I shown you before. And uh, we are um, going through this, this set of data and predict, uh, marking the correct predic uh, prediction by one. If it's not correct, uh, it's zero. Uh, and then we are mm, using average by uh, method. So, mm, when, we, uh, when we evaluate this method, we get, basically I will show you how, how, it's, how fast it is to run uh, this simple model on, uh, on F sharp. Okay, so. Okay. Oops. So. We have our code and we have our results uh, somewhere here. <laughs> Basically, the, the correct match is equal to 93%, which is, I'd say, a good result. And uh, by doing so naive implementation, because it's not, it's not a neural network or any other high-end classificators, we are getting very good result. But as I said, for sustaining this kind of performance, for our model, we need we should have implemented something, which, given the more data, some something from outside, for example, using uh, Open C C V framework, the images would will come up and will be formatted, so they will be centered in the middle and uh, in high resolution, so our model could classify the images in correct way. 
So, this is the first classifier. Um, okay. Tick. The second one is called support vector machine. And the name is intimidating, but uh, it's really not. It's very simple, but the mind be math be behind this one is, I'd say, complicated. Um, what we need basically do is to read our da training data set and try to split it in a two-dimensional plane by the classes. And basically what is shown here is the split up between two classes and even given the fact that we have 10 digits from 0 to 9, we need to have 10 classes in our case. So first we need to split up the, the, the classes from each other as much as possible. Then we are drawing a line, so it's called hyperplane I think in this case. And this line will tell us what are the might mm, say the key differences between uh, each class and uh, by doing so we are receiving not a confidence level but we are receiving a, a class so we are generally more accurate I'd say what is it different from from other uh, binary classifiers so one uh, one versus one uh, machines uh, and so on is that the labels are encoded as minus one and one. That is the very key difference. And the line, so the, how the, this, this line is magically drawn between all of the classes. We do so, we do something called, uh, we re we're using something called gradient descent. And what gradient descent is, is the function which will minimize our loss. So we won't have to Mm, we will guarantee that the, 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 the line is drawn as much wide as possible. Uh, I won't go in much more detail about, about gradient descent because uh, time reasons, I'd say. <laughs> uh, what is also worth not noticing that this classifier is only usable in supervised machine learning. There are two types of machine learning. One is supervised and another one is non-supervised. What does it mean? It means that supervised machine learning, in supervised machine learning we are providing data which contains labels. So we know what, does, uh, what this data means. In non-supervised uh, machine learning we don't have this kind of information. Um, and unfortunate um, Accord.net provides multi-class multi support for uh, this kind of case. So we don't need to bother ourselves what's going on and all of this is going under the hood, I'd say. So in this case, We are now using Accord.net, and in the, as in the previous example, we are reading the, the file, so the whole uh, training set, and unzipping it, unzipping it so we can have uh, labels and images separate. And after that, we are using a lambda for, for like I, I'd say a core, so we would we need to give the algorithm our data in the precise way as the documentation and the implementation needs to. So we give them class inputs, outputs, helper variables, and the strategy. We are creating the strategy and then returning it. That's basically it. So it's very simple, I'd say. Well, the only thing I need to do in this case is go to the documentation, read through it, and after I know how this classifier and algorithm behaves, I, would, I could write something like this. It's very uh, helpful, I'd say. And after that, we proceed in, uh, like I'd, I'd say, in a normal way. So we are creating a model. Then we are using this model to 
initialize the learner and after that we are basically uh, also wrapping up our config around the the support vector machine learning configuration function uh, after that we are, we are we are assigning our config to, to, to the learner from which was created previously and we are basically running the the algorithm so the classifier and what is nice I'd say is that we are just assigning the we have something called error which basically gives us the output uh, of this classification um, after that to validate if our model is behaving correctly we are using uh, support vector machines compute function and as, a uh, as in the previous example if the mm, predicate is correct, we are mm, assigning one. If not, we are assigning zero. Uh, I won't be running this classifier because it's it's taking a while. I'd say 10 to 15 minutes complete. But in this case, the accuracy is 91%, which is also not not very bad for how many lines of code? I'd say 14 so this for, 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 for the comparison between functional language and, and C sharp this would take multi hundreds of lines of code in C sharp and in here we have only 14 so you are using the library so yeah of course we are using the library but it, in, it would uh, in, in because I did it in C sharp when I was writing code in, in Xamarin, it still it took multiple, uh, multiple, uh, not not hundreds maybe, but at least a hundred lines of code. Uh, okay. So moving back. Um, now we have our magical neural networks. In Neural networks, uh, perhaps everyone has heard about neural networks somewhere in, in, in your job or somewhere in the internet. They are basically inspired by how the brain works, etc. Uh, we will focus on more silicon way to approach this problem and this classifier. Neural networks are very different, I'd say. There are multiple uh, I'd say types of neural networks. There are neural networks which are uh, designed to classify images, so that would be called convolutional neural networks. There are recurrent neural networks, uh, long short term memory neural networks. Uh, I've heard about the concept of uh, neuron gas, which is completely abstract for me at the moment. But, but this it is, in essence, is that is this is it a, a collection of neurons? Which those neurons are basically organized in layers. We have one input layer, one output layer, and it can, uh, but it doesn't need to have the hidden layers in. in it should have the, the hidden layers in in, in the middle. Um, in in our case. We have in input 984 pixels, so that would be our array, and the output would be one of the 10 digits. Um, so the neurons are represented as a layer of clusters, etc. Each of them corresponds to one of the digits, I say. Yeah. How does it work? The model takes an image. Um, model takes the image, sends it to the input of neural network, and then basically transforms it into one of zero uh, for each possible output. That's the book, what it says. So, getting in much detail how those connections are made and how are they um, resulting in the, in the output signal. Basically, we are each and every input uh, contains a value when in which we initialize uh, and it also contains a weight on every connection and we basic, what we basically do is we 
add them times the weight and after that, after we add them together and multiply them, we add something called threshold or bias. The bias is a value which could, uh, which guarantees us that if the, the neural network will uh, basically does not, uh, will be ran not random, but it will contain randomizable value, I'd say. And after that, we um, wrap up those things together and in, uh, around them and apply something called activation function. In our case, we will use bipolar activation, uh, sigmoid actual, uh, bipolar sigmoid activation function, but there are many and many of them. Nowadays, something called uh, ReLU, Rectified Linear Unit, is very popular, but in this case we all will be using something older. Um, what this activation function does, it combines uh, all of those things, converts it in the signal, which uh, if and if this signal is higher, uh, contains the higher value than the, than the bias, it moves it forward. The training, of course, is very simple, but we have uh, a number of questions to ask to ourselves. Let's say, how many neurons should we have in the hidden layer? And how do we train such classifier? Because it's, the training of this classifier is very different from the two examples which I have shown to you. Um, and if we have, for example, without something like this, so we have the first layer and the second layer, we have eight, around 8,000 interconnections between, our, between them. So it's very, I'd say, resource consuming and, and, um, uh, and res resource and time consuming. Um, but to approach those problems, we use something called uh, something called back propagation. Back propagation is a very uh, similar method to the gradient descent. What we basically do is uh, we feed network with the examples. After that, we compare the model with our output, and then uh, we go backwards and by um, by layer by layer and basically adjust the the networks for. Uh, to reduce the error rate, which we are causing. Um, in our case, we will need, of course, the Accor.NET framework, and uh, this is handled by this framework, so that's A for us. What basically this framework does is initialize all, all of the nodes by some random value. So in essence, uh, training this it's very simple, but it's very time-consuming, and it requires a lot of resources, I'd say. So, let's see how this is done in, in F-Sharp and Accord.net framework. Of course, we are implementing some, uh, using some of the parts of the Accord.net framework, and after that, we are re again reading the file, and after that, we are go straight to the training. Um, so, in this case, we are using something called one-hot vectors instead of the values. What dot net, uh, what one-hot vectors are used for is it converts uh, all of the um, all of the examples to from scalars to, to those kind of rec vectors so we know to which class belongs every one of examples so we do this first and after that we basically create a function which will activate our neural network uh, it takes number of parameters so the first one will be our activation function which will take a value from minus minus one to one uh, after that, we have the first layer. So the first layer will be will consist of uh, 784 pic uh, neurons. Um, the the third argument is how many layers in the uh, so how many remaining layers we would like to have 
if we would um, allow only one argument, we would have only one layer, so integrate only two. In this case, we have one hidden layer consisting of 500 neurons and one output layer. After that, we are using something to initialize our data. And as in the previous example, we are uh, running this network. So we are, we are creating this, this teacher. And that's basically it. Um, after that, we are recurrently calling the, our, I'd say, teacher by uh, number of, uh, number of um, epochs which we provide in train network function. And it provides us the error rate and how many iterations have gone past. Um, for this case, I've created a neural uh, network with for 500 epochs, but that's a lot, and I will show you guys how it's performing for 10, I'd say. Of course, after that, after, after training our network, we are validating how many how many uh, uh, labels have been correctly uh, recognized. So I will run this very quick. So as you can see in first epoch, the error rate is very high, I'd say, and even going so, it's getting bigger, and we might think that something is going wrong. It's not going wrong because as the network flows, in, it first needs to read all through all of our data. After that, in, it's basically adjusting the neurons and the error rate is getting lower and lower. Uh, the result will be very low and after training this neural network for, I think, an hour, I got 82% of correct match which the result is not very good, but I think that after running this network for longer periods of time, the result would be better, but it would be as good as the SVM machine, I think. Um, so we, last, we wait for two last epochs. And It's not saved. <laughs> okay. I will run this and go back. Okay. So. So. So I'll, be, I'll move back to my presentation. Uh, okay. So, in summary, SVMs got the best result for a small chunk of data. I don't compare our first classifier because I wanted to make a co only comparison between SVMs and uh, neural networks. Uh, neural networks are the best if we have the resources, of course, and the data because the case is that neural networks are outperforming every classifier only, like not only. The one of the conditions is that we need to have a chunk of data to, to, to play with, to, to have network play with. Uh, networks, the big advantage is that the networks have multiple inputs, as I showed you before. We had 784 inputs. SVMs have only one. And the key difference is that SVMs can more like the, let's say the, the biggest use case for support vector machines is that they are used for classification. Neural networks are uh, adaptable to most of the business cases. So because they are, this is so hot topics and things are popping up every single day, uh, I'd say neural networks are the best. Uh, so they can, it's the, it's the hottest topic out there for machine learning. Um, for the recommendations, 
if anyone was interested by this presentation, I refer you to those two uh, GitHub users. The first one is the author of this book, Machine Learning for .NET Developers. And all of this, his code is written in F Sharp, so I'd say it's mm, mostly better explained than me. <laughs> but the second source is mostly in Python, but the, this guy has amazing YouTube channel and I strongly recommend to you go and check it, this, his content out because he's not only explaining how to code machine learning stuff in Python, but he also explains the basic concepts behind it. So it can be helpful for all of you, I think. So that's it for from me. Does anyone have any questions? No um, question. <laughs> How did you choose the value of uh, the number of neurons in your hidden layer and the number of hidden layers? Well, I have played with it. <laughs> so, for example, because five numbers is, is five hundred is just a number. We can play around with those numbers and see how the network is performing. Because I haven't sent that. Obviously, but uh, machine learning is all about running the training, seeing how the model performs, and basically adjusting hyperparameters. One of the hyperparameters is number of layers and number of neurons we have on those layers. So it's basically try and go concept. Yeah. And this was the best one. Oh. Yes. No more questions. Okay, so thank you very much.